Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Steve Aidy. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies here. And uh, we're really excited that you have an interest in biomedical engineering. And um, we have a, a really um, uh, sort of exciting program that uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about today. And um, looking forward to, of course, seeing you guys uh, on campus as well uh, in the fall. So with that, let me uh, introduce uh, Professor Marilyn uh, van der Merlin. Uh, she is the Director of uh, Biomedical Engineering. Hi, Steve. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it, as Steve has said. So my name is Marilyn van der Merlin, and I'm the Director of the Mining School. And um, I'd like to welcome you to Cornell and make a couple um, opening remarks. Um, so uh, the, the goal here is to give you some information about Cornell and Cornell Biomedical Engineering in particular. And um, I think reflecting on the last several years, um, we're coming out of a very strange time and um, having been through this pandemic, it's changed our world profoundly. But something that very much came out um, that was very evident is really the importance of and the relevance of biomedical engineering um, to something like the last three years that we've lived in. And we can see this in vaccine development, which was done by biomedical engineers, uh, respirator design in which engineering was heavily involved, and also things like predicting disease transmission and um, the, the growth curves for how viruses will propagate to, and um, the epidemiology of the disease. And so despite this being a, a negative experience in many ways, um, it really brought home uh, why biomedical engineering is so important and did so in a very profound way. Um, so I want to say a couple things about to let you know um, about Cornell engineering and then also about biomedical engineering. And we hope that this brief preview gives you a little bit of a sense of what a biomedical engineering major would look like were you to join us. Um, so I want to start with the fact that engineering at Cornell is a very has a very deep history and was part of the founding of the university when the university was founded in 1865. And what's really unique about Cornell is that it was a co-ed and integrated university at the start of its founding. Um, and so this applies to engineering, but applies to the whole university, in fact. Um, when we look at engineering, the College of Engineering is a very broad college within the university and it has a really big range of specialties, um, including things that you're more familiar with, like mechanical engineering, and then also something that's much less familiar, like applied and engineering physics. So biomedical engineering is the um, newest of those majors in the college. Um, so first of all, we are engineers, just like all the rest of the engineers, but our focus is um, almost, the, our breadth is almost the same as a whole college, but all of what we all have in common is our focus on a particular application, which is human health. So we're engineers and we build and we analyze and we design objects and processes like all engineers do, but we do this in the context of human health. And as I just said, we're the youngest department in the College of Engineering. The department was founded in 2004, um, so we, we uh, are close to our 20th anniversary coming up. Um, but the majority of that time, we are graduate departments. So we have an undergraduate major that's even newer that began in 2015 uh, with a sophomore class of 19 students. And we've rapidly grown since that time. Um, and in that time, uh, we've also gained some amount of prominence in terms of what our rankings are. And, um, and we've now graduated five classes of engineers from the department. So it's a really exciting thing to have and, and to see the growth of the department. Um, and then one other thing that's been very unique is the degree to which we are female in the in the major, um, which is um, a little different than than the, the 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 national averages of engineering. And this applies to the biomedical engineering major as well as to um, the College of Engineering at Cornell. The College of Engineering is fifty fifty female, and biomedical engineering is uh, a little bit higher than that. In fact, um, I'm proud to say we're around seventy percent of female. Um, and that's a unique situation among engineering majors. And I think it's led to some focus um, in some of the senior projects and things like that on underrepresented populations that are quite important and normally aren't necessarily represented in a college of engineering or in a major and the things that we, uh, the, the topics of design projects and the things that we care about. So I wanna again, thank you all for being here. I wanna welcome you. And, um, and then I wanna turn, it, this, turn this back over to Steve and to the panelists and um, thank you for being here today. And I know you're sort of in different locations. So if you're in the evening, thanks for spending your evening here. And uh, depending on where you are, you're maybe not in the evening, but again, um, and we hope to see you live in person on campus. And uh, meanwhile, if there's things that we can help with, please reach out by email as well. So thank you all for being here. Steve, back to you. All right. 
Um, so actually, before I begin, um, let me also uh, introduce uh, Sharon. Uh, Sharon is our undergraduate coordinator, and we like to think of her as like a, a mother for our students while you're here. Um, they are, we, we will be your new family, and um, yeah, so you'll get to know Sharon pretty well. And then uh, uh, Tony is um, sort of the administrative director, uh, director on the administration side here. So uh, with that, uh, let me just share screen and uh, oops, I think I'm not in the right place. That is not. Uh, sorry, just give me stop share. Too many windows. Um, while you're looking for your presentation, Steve, I just yeah. want to let everyone know yeah. that um, we will hear from our alumni and our current undergraduates um, uh, today, at least a little bit later on, as well as we'll have time for um, your questions towards the end. So I just want to let you all know that. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for um, chiming in with that. Yep. Okay, guys. Uh, so let me uh, jump into this. Can you see my screen now? Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Um, so as uh, Marilene said, um, uh, you know, sort of address this question, what is it that makes biomedical engineering uh, unique um, or different from other uh, engineering disciplines of the life sciences? And, and it, it, it's, uh, it's that we're, we're engineers uh, uh, first and foremost. Um, and so we like to uh, use quantitative tools to describe uh, biological processes, to model uh, disease processes. Um, and so, uh, but even on the engineering side, we do have, um, we're, at, we're, we're sort of uh, pushing forward new frontiers of engineering. And this is very much motivated um, by biological problems and um, especially uh, problems in uh, human health. So, uh, so we have these uh, complex uh, biological systems that we have to, uh, we, we need to understand from an engineering perspective, how, they, how it works, how, they, how the human body works, and then how um, various uh, processes are perturbed by disease and, and, and what can we do to uh, go and, uh, you know, re-engineer uh, people back to uh, wellness and health. <clears throat> And so, uh, if you if you look at uh, the sorts of things that uh, engineers, biomedical engineers, need to do, uh, we need to be able to represent and analyze uh, complex engineering systems, and then a lot of uh, control systems, uh, engineering uh, theory, and 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 feedback networks, and so forth are uh, relevant. And and in this case, we've uh, often got more complexity uh, in in the. Uh, biological system that we have to contend with. And then we do want to uh, understand from a design perspective, uh, understand the natural uh, design principles that uh, through which uh, the human body and other, you know, biological uh, processes function. And then this requires uh, understanding at many different spatial scales uh, from uh, subcellular uh, molecular processes uh, to, to cells, to um, extracellular matrix and ultimately the uh, the whole human body. And of course, uh, we also need to, when we're uh, developing and and testing uh, new solutions to design, uh, you know, the future of human health, uh, we do need to test these, and then we need to be uh, cognizant of uh, the scientific design, uh, the scientific process as well of hypothesis testing. And so you can think of, think of biomedical engineers as, as in some sense, uh, having a, a foot in, um, in, in mathematics and computing and, and the physical sciences and design and combining that with uh, biological um, and sort of medical hypothesis testing and uh, being able to uh, put those things together. And of course, um, we, uh, in our program uh, throughout, we want to think about any solutions that we design, uh, how they will fit in with the, uh, the current standard of healthcare. And, um, and throughout our program as well, you have a lot of opportunity to uh, practice um, creativity. 
So um, here, here in biomedical engineering, we uh, essentially uh, approach a program uh, through innovative uh, um, uh, pedagogical approaches. So we have uh, faculty who have, um, uh, you know, published in education uh, um, journals. So we uh, can really combine um, innovative ways of teaching things uh, with a, a multi-scale uh, approach um, and uh, experiential learning as well is a really important uh, part of our program. So, uh, so when we combine all of these uh, uh, things together, you uh, you'll get to, uh, of course, um, learn about and and practice uh, professional skills that will end up um, being uh, you know, used in your future uh, careers. So if you look at our program, we essentially have uh, all our engineers in the College of Engineering. Uh, they take a, a common core curriculum, and this is your um, mathematics, physics, chemistry, uh, biology, and computer science. And then we have uh, what are known as these cornerstone uh, courses, which essentially give you exposure to the application space in BME as a something up front um, so that when you then learn about uh, the um, the theory and uh, the the approaches the computational approaches and so forth uh, we try to teach that in the context of applications so things make sense and uh, this gives you a real uh, motivation to uh, to learn these uh, these fundamentals and um, we then have like uh, uh, what what is known as a core sequence which is uh, essentially how um, cells and um, how the body is, is organized from, you know, subcellular uh, to cells to, to uh, organs and um, um, systems. Uh, and so this is like a multi-scale approach to uh, an engineer's approach to understanding uh, biological function and, and disease. And then we also have um, what are known as these four concentrations, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And these allow you to go into uh, a lot of depth in one specific area. So our program has um, a wide breadth, um, a multidisciplinary um, coverage, but then you also get to choose uh, one concentration to go into uh, um, a lot of depth to give you um, expertise that um, you will uh, want to be using in your, in your future careers. And then uh, I did mention that we have uh, experiential learning where we think it's really important that you also reflect on your role as an engineer, uh, a biomedical engineer, and what does a biomedical engineer bring to society. Um, and it's uh, really important in, in forming your identity as well uh, as, a, um, as a biomedical engineer. And then we uh, try to bring uh, people with uh, students with different concentration expertise together at the end uh, to form teams to uh, address uh, design problems. Um, and this is uh, how things will often work in industry where you have uh, people on a team with different expertise uh, who need to work together to, uh, to solve some uh, important problem in healthcare or um, in the case of biomedical engineering. So, um, so the, the core uh, sequence, um, uh, essentially, again, it, we very much value the multi, a multi-scale view of the human body. And so we want to be able to uh, understand things from a quantitative perspective, to be able to write down equations that describe uh, and model uh, processes, you know, from the molecular to organ system scales and um, very much think apply uh, applying engineering principles to understanding uh, human um, ph physiological function as well as disease. Um, and then we um, uh, want you know want you guys to develop um, the the skills that are necessary to uh, tackle open-ended problems and this would include you know modeling and simulation, and um, <clears throat> robust engineering uh, of system design. And then there will be a lot of opportunity in our curriculum to practice uh, creativity as well. And so we want you to 
uh, start to develop your own uh, ways of thinking about problems and um, you know novel ways of solving these so that when you get out into the, the workforce, um, you already have a lot of this experience under your belt. Un under your belt. And then um, understanding uh, human factors as well. So it's not just about uh, thinking about, uh, you know, generating a solution that is, you know, going to address some cellular problem, but we want to want you to be aware of how that will interact with other uh, systems in the body and um, uh, think about a more uh, holistic um, uh, approach to, to design as well. So here are our uh, four concentration areas, uh, molecular, cellular, and systems engineering, biomaterials and drug delivery, and biomedical imaging and instrumentation, and biomechanics and mechanobiology. So I'll just go into uh, each uh, of these in a little bit of detail. So you can think about um, MCSE as uh, essentially the uh, integration of data science uh, and simulation uh, and um, uh, tissue engineering, right? And so, so the idea is uh, how can we use these sort of quantitative approaches uh, to design novel molecules to uh, maybe perturb some uh, biological function? And then how could we um, sort of refine the, uh, you know, maybe some therapy that you're developing uh, using cell culture models and then uh, progressively in, uh, using more and more complicated systems and ultimately applied uh, to the human body with the with the idea of being able to design customized treatments for uh, you know for for patients depending on their uh, specific conditions um, and symptoms and so forth. <clears throat> and then in uh, biomaterials and drug delivery, uh, the idea here is uh, we want to be able to you know not just uh, print uh, functioning, uh, you know, biomaterials that can be implanted into the body, but we want to think about that in a more holistic uh, approach, where uh, how can we use the host um, uh, response and interaction with this biomaterial to enhance its function, right? And so maybe this might be uh, controlling the biomechanical properties of this material, right? Um, how, how can we engage the uh, the immune system and interact with the immune system? And so um, uh, BMDD uh, uh, is will train you in this uh, sort of holistic uh, approach to um, the use and design of, of biomaterials. Uh, biomedical imaging and instrumentation. So uh, this is where um, is concerned with uh, developing instruments that can essentially uh, look into the human body, into biological systems that we engineer to uh, to use for studies in a non-invasive way, right? And maybe even perturb the function of these uh, systems and study uh, study that as well. And so, uh, once again, multi-scale uh, is a, a strong theme here. So we have um, faculty who are very strong in optical imaging. Uh, but then we also have representation uh, at the medical imaging uh, technology side as well, MRI, and students who go through um, these um, uh, BMII will, will certainly get um, exposure to all of the medical imaging uh, technologies as well as um, research methods as well. And then uh, it's not just about acquiring data, but it's also about what kind of uh, information can be uh, extracted from uh, from this data, and uh, you know this might be uh, information in three D space. Um, so how does the, the the structure of tissue change with uh, development of of disease and and, and function, um, uh, and then also look at that as a fun as um, as time progresses as well. So uh, multi scale in space, but also across uh, time scales as well. Um, biomechanics and mechanobiology. So th this is uh, really concerned about um, how biomechanical properties um, are, you know, it involves a study of biomechanical properties and how this is related to, um, you know, artificial 
limbs and 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 you know materials that are implanted into the in, into the body. Um, uh, but then also on a, a much smaller scale, how does the biomechanical environment of cells influence um, its behavior? Uh, for instance, it's known that um, uh, the local mechanical properties of the, the neighborhood in which cells grow up in, uh, mechanical properties um, are a really important uh, cue for um, normal physiological function. Uh, but also can trigger the onset and progression of diseases like uh, cancer. And so um, uh, this area is really trying to study the role of biomechanics in the processes of life and disease at multiple different spatial scales. So I, I mentioned uh, experiential learning. And uh, what we mean by this is um, we will sort of encourage everyone to be involved in some kind of practical real world application of your um, engineering knowledge. Uh, this could be through laboratory research. It could be um, through being a TA for a, for a course. Um, and then we also have a lot of um, educational outreach activities uh, from K, K through 12, um, uh, some interactions with the local science center, and engage Cornell. And then there's project teams as well. So multiple project teams that our students do get involved in. And the idea behind experiential learning is um, to reflect on these practical uh, activities and, and think about um, how that shapes your, uh, your thinking as a, as a biomedical engineer and what the role of a biomedical engineer might be in different, um, you know, social uh, settings and, and society uh, at large. Um, so at the very end, the, the final year in your, in your senior year, uh, then we actually build, uh, bring people uh, together to design, build and test um, various uh, uh, solutions to design problems. Uh, some of these design problems, the um, individual students come up with Others have been proposed by uh, industry um, or, um, or uh, you know, come from a clinical setting, right? And so the, uh, the uh, process here that the approach to design is it's a two semester sequence. And uh, the first semester is essentially, you know, uh, training in the, in the various um, instrumentation and, and data analysis that uh, you'll need to essentially um, work together on these design problems, and you get a lot of uh, practical um, uh, apprenticeship um, and and so forth. And these are uh, the pedagogical material is for this has been uh, put together by various different faculty members who've had uh, industry experience. Uh, and of course, um, as you can see here, the uh, problems that have been posed by industry and hospitals. Um, some some problems actually come about from international collaborations as well. So we do have a, a program where uh, students from another university in Tanzania work together with um, our students on um, uh, design problems um, for the for you know for the for the hospitals in in, in, a, in a third world um, um, countries. And then. Um, you'll have a chance to uh, showcase, uh, show off a little bit, I suppose. Uh, and this is um, a BME uh, showcase event where uh, often we'll have um, people from industry and or um, from a clinical setting as well who um, will be present. And it's a good way to also form uh, networks and, um, and these will help you in your uh, next stages of your career as well. So we do have multiple pathways through our program. Uh, we do have a, a pre-health uh, pathway. There's, you can do some of your um, uh, study abroad. Um, there are you know, co-op or internship uh, opportunities. We have an honors program as well for those of you who want to get a little bit more involved in research. And then we also have a uh, a four and a half year BS MEng program. So you essentially start your MEng 
uh, program in the last semester of your undergraduate um, studies. And you, you spend an extra semester and you graduate with both a bachelor's and uh, master's of engineering. And uh, yeah, so uh, other opportunities, including uh, combining uh, biomedical engineering with um, business as well. So uh, yeah, like Marilyn mentioned, uh, we do rank pretty well. This is, I think this is old right now, but I, I think this ranking hasn't changed too much, um, uh, but we are, uh, you know, after just uh, six years or so, um, we we have definitely risen up pretty um, pretty well in the rankings. Um, Marilyn did mention that we do have um, very high representation of women in our program as well, and uh, here you can see how that uh, has varied over time. And um, yeah, maybe we, we definitely have more women than men, but we are uh, sort of, I guess, heading towards uh, gender parity. And then if you're wondering where do our graduates go, uh, probably about 50% go off to industry and uh, the other 50% go off to uh, graduate or professional school. This may be um, PhD programs or an MEng program um, or uh, medical uh, medical school um, for the graduate or professional school, and then about yeah fifty percent or so go off to uh, industry. So um, yeah, I, I just wanted to maybe finish up by saying uh, biomedical engineering uh, because of its breadth and also the depth that we are trying to get you guys to cover. Uh, it is a challenging major. Uh, but we are invested in your success. We want you guys, all of you, to be successful in our program. And so we're here to help you do that and also to have uh, some fun uh, along the way as well. So with that, let me just stop sharing this and uh, maybe take some questions if anyone has about the, the program in general. Um, and then after that, maybe we can get our students to introduce themselves and uh, answer additional questions as well. So feel free to type it in the chat or um, just put your hand up and- oh, Steve, we've already, we've already answered a few basic questions. Okay. Uh, the Q and A session section. Uh, looks like we got some two. Great, more. I've been busy talking and I haven't seen them, but yeah. So here's a question: uh, Can undergraduates, not seniors, also visit the BME Design Showcase, or is it more for just industry personnel? I mean, I I think we do let the department know when we have these kind of events. Um, so uh, people, uh, students, other undergraduates will uh, get get an opportunity to to visit. I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think I think generally those are considered largely community events. Not all of them, but yeah. most of them we try and make it a community type feel. Uh, next question: How easy is it to get involved in project teams or research in your freshman year? <laughs> Yeah, this almost is a is a question for our students, right? Because they're they're the ones who are in research or uh, project teams. Uh, I would say, from the faculty perspective, um, we generally uh, very encouraging of undergraduates to come and uh, you know, help out in in our research. And sometimes um, our undergraduates are fantastic, and they may uh, end up, you know, doing great work that is publishable and going off to conferences to represent the group and and so forth. Um, so I, I I know less about the project teams side of things, but I don't know if one of the students want to chime in on that. I'm thinking that maybe we should have the students introduce themselves and say yeah. a little bit about themselves and then we can come back to the questions because I'm sure that yep. the, the students and the alumni have a lot to contribute to this. Why don't, why don't we get started with uh, Parker Dean? All right, great. Um, well, hi everyone. It's great to see so many people in the call. Um, 
My name is Parker. I am now an MEng, uh, so I'm doing my it's a one year program after the undergrad. But I did my undergrad here. I graduated with class of 2022. Um, I was in the biomechanics and mechanobiology concentration. But um, kind of leading into this question a little bit, I wanted to talk about some of the highlights in terms of things that I've gotten out of this program. Um, in that I did uh, four years of research here, or like I guess seven semesters where I, I started my freshman year after you know bugging people a lot to, to work in a lab. And I got some really great experiences out of that. I was in the butcher lab for three of those years um, and ended up doing the honors program and um, that honors thesis. So definitely would be happy to, once we get into more of these questions, talk about those kinds of things, but yeah. Sharon, who's up next? Um, how, how about we have uh, Shweta? Thank you, Parker, and Shweta is next. Hi, everyone. My name is Shweta. Nice meeting you all. Um, I was in the class of 2019, so it's nice to see how much this program has evolved in just a few years. Um, after graduating, I worked at Merck for two years as a scientist in drug product manufacturing. And through that, I realized that I kind of wanted to pivot in my career. Um, so I started doing a part-time master's program. And that led me to uh, switch jobs into regulatory affairs. Um, so I've been working at a women's health biopharma company for the past year and a half. And overall, I feel like Cornell BME really gave me the understanding that I needed to be in the biotech biopharma industry and gave me really good lab experience as well. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about transitioning to the industry. Thank you, Shweta. Um, how about we have Raj go next? All right. Uh, so I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm uh, Raj Deep Energy. You can just call me Raj. Uh, I'm a junior right now in BME from Boston, and I'm concentrating currently in biomedical imaging and instrumentation. Uh, and so I'll be graduating next year, May 2024. So uh, my experiences have been a little bit more diverse in that, like, I didn't start off in research as a freshman. Uh, my first the real major experience was as actually both simultaneously a residential advisor and a teaching assistant for two courses, one a physics course, physics 1112, and also CS 1112. Uh, but in the fall of my junior year, I actually pivoted to Dr. Aidy's lab. So I'm actually now working in his lab on uh, aberration diverse OCT for ultra deep imaging and biological tissue. And the funny thing was, I actually didn't know coming in that I wanted to do imaging, right? I, I've always been and still am somebody who likes to explore everything. Um, but the biggest asset for me in Cornell's BME program has been the fact that, like both Dr. Vanderbilt and Dr. Rady mentioned, you know, it's very open, it's very broad, it's very multi-scale. And the thing that stood out for me is in a lot of the classes, it's very hands-on, right? particular lab courses like BME 3030, BME 3020, a lot of your 3000 level courses in particular uh, kind of helped me decide what I wanted to do. But both the breadth and the depth was really helpful in deciding uh, where I ultimately wanted to go. And um, I'm happy to talk to you guys about a, a lot of the experiences and opportunities that are available. Thanks, Raj. Alexandra, you're next. Yeah, hi. So my name is Alexandra. I'm currently a senior in the BME department, and my concentration is biomechanics and mechanobiology. Um, currently, I'm also doing the 4.5 year bachelor's and master's program. So I started my master's early and I'm finishing up this December with just an extra semester. Um, during my time here, I've been majorly a part of project team programs. So I've joined in my freshman year, my first semester, and I've been a part of it for, I think, all of my semesters here now. Um, I've definitely had an amazing experience. Um, I started up as a regular person who was kind of like building and engineering stuff for my team. And then as the years went on, I kind of rose to the position of being the lead of the team. So if you have any questions about particularly like how does project teams work, um, what kind of experience you might get there, I'm more than happy to answer those as well. Thanks, Alexandra. Okay, um, so unless uh, any of the panelists have anything additional to add, we can open it up to questions. I can read them out one by one. If folks in the audience have a question for a specific person, you can write that in the Q&A and uh, we can get started. Um, 
how easy is it to get involved in project teams research in the freshman year? So maybe I can take that one. Um, so in your freshman year, there's a big festival that happens at the beginning of the semester where like all the project teams, I think there are 32 of them, don't quote me on that, um, but 32 of them in total in the university and all of them just like assemble in this one big um, atrium called Duffield Atrium. And then they present what they're working on. And these projects range from, for example, cars to building bridges to engineering world health to all the biomedical devices. And um, you like it's basically like a showcase for the students to kind of get a sense of like what there is to offer. And then afterwards, after you kind of get a sense of what there is there, um, there's generally an application, and then you apply to these project teams. You usually have your first round of interviews. And then I'd say about a good majority who apply get onto the teams. And yeah, after that, you just learn so much. And like all people there are kind of very supportive and kind of helping you develop as you go. Yeah, I suppose I can kind of add on from the research point of view, um, especially for those of you who are not quite sure where you want to go. Um, what worked for me, uh, you know, I was actually in a different re uh, research position for a very short time, but I switched out so you can also rotate. But the best thing that worked for me was, you know, if you have a class that you really like or a professor that uh, you think is doing a good job teaching course and helping you understand the material and you feel like you're really enjoying it, you know, don't be afraid to just go up and start with, uh, you know, what's your research area, what kinds of things and opportunities are available. It's important to realize that uh, the professors, as well as the, the administrative department, you know, Sharon has been really helpful for me in a lot of things as well. Just go and ask. We're all here to help you. And uh, even from the time that you're a freshman, you can definitely get a lot of support, be it project teams or research. Um, I've had a lot of friends who have uh, applied to project teams, and I can also speak to the fact that it is at times a little competitive. Uh, so if you want to, you know, start off somewhere, build a bit of experience, it's certainly going in the research direction and then pivoting may also be a good idea if you're more interested in the industry. But the biggest thing is just get started early. Okay, uh, the next question is about the pre-med or, or pre-health path, and how does the BME pre-health path look different from the traditional BME path? I don't think we have any uh, students actually, who are on that path, but oh, go ahead, Raj. Yeah, so I uh, I am actually intending to go to medical school uh, after those these four years. So in terms of the way the BME program is integrated into the pre-health track, a lot of the BME courses will give you the foundational knowledge, right, for the MCAT, which you'll take typically in the summer of uh, your junior, like between your summer of your sophomore year and the summer of your junior year. Um, there are a couple of additional courses you'll have to take. Uh, for example, BIOG 1500 is a lab course in biology, uh, as well as the classic and infamous uh, organic chemistry 3570, 3580, which is dreaded by many students. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, only a few more courses uh, uh, are needed in addition to your BME courses. Uh, there are options both in and outside of BME for things like genetics and like anatomy and phys to support you if you want to do more lab work or if you want to get more, uh, you know, uh, experience in a particular area. But in general, BME is one of the easiest ways to sort of hit those check boxes on most of the requirements for your for uh, pre-med, right, because there's no specific track, but uh, definitely it works really well with the uh, pre-med requirements. Anybody else have anything to add on the pre-med path? Um, I'd be happy to chime in, uh, not as somebody who's going down that track, but I've definitely had a lot of friends um, in my graduating class who were, I think, I, my, my graduating class was small. I know the next one is about the size of graduating classes. We were about 30, um, but I know a good many who do. I know I have a friend right now who is in the image with me as well, who's doing an MD PhD. Uh, she just got accepted at Case Western. And I want to just uh, echo what Raj has said, as well as saying that you know, it depends on, it's good to look at the requirements for the different schools, because I have heard that, you know, whether you can take what we call baby orgo versus, you know, the full uh, two semesters or things like that. Uh, there are lots of people who are available to help. I know we have some resources for pre-health. So it's one of those things that, you know, people are very successful going from BME 
Um, and I think maybe a little bit more so than some of the other engineering majors, but it's totally doable and there are people at your resources to help. Yeah, and I will add that um, Cornell has a new office called the Health Professions Advising Center, which has really centralized support to people on the pre-health path. Um, and I did, the person who asked the question, I uh, added that link um, in the q and I'm not sure how to add it for everyone though. If anybody can tell me that, that'd be great. Uh, I don't see, I think the chat is just for uh, the, the uh, panelists. But in any case, moving on to the next question, um, how large is the average graduating class of BME students? Um, I can take that one in continuation of what Parker said. Um, this year we have 40, uh, 2023, we have 42 in our graduating class. And uh, in 2024, we will be up to 56. After that, we'll be around 70. Okay, is there a separate evaluation for getting biomedical engineering after freshman year? I think this is the affiliation process, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Genevieve. Um, so yeah, in the engineering school, you affiliate with a major uh, after the first semester of your sophomore year. So you will have three semesters to decide which major you would like to go for. And at the end of your um, first semester, soft, fall sophomore year, you will apply for affiliation. And as long as you meet the um, conditions of affiliation for the major, you will be admitted to that major. And how about picking your concentration? There's a question later after mm -hmm. you be a me then you pick your concentration. Can you talk through that process too, please? Um, yeah, sure. Um, okay. Sorry, were you, were you gonna say something, Sharon, about the timeline? No, no, so yeah, you take that, you pick that yeah. one too. Yeah, so so students uh, generally uh, pick a concentration in the, in the junior year, right? And uh, so the idea is the, uh, the cornerstone courses will give you a lot of experience in each of these different concentration areas. So we do have cornerstone courses that are targeting each of the concentrations. So you'll get an exposure to the uh, applications as well as the, the sort of the major theory and, and ways of thinking about problems in that application space. So um, combined uh, with any other experiences that you have in uh, research or project teams. Uh, all of this is, uh, you know, useful knowledge. You'll have a faculty advisor to discuss your career choices with. Uh, you can always come and talk with Sharon or myself, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of support uh, in place to give you the right experiences uh, in each of the concentration areas uh, that will help to inform your choices and a lot of other um, um, activities and things that you can get involved in uh, beyond uh, classwork and and labs and so forth that will um, that will help you to to make those uh, that choice of concentration. And then in terms of the courses required, uh, we have a a wonderful handbook that uh, essentially. Um, like outlines for each concentration, what are the required courses, what are the elective courses that you can take. Uh, and so there are uh, like required and electives in each, each of the categories that um, it's like, a, it's like a, a checklist for the required courses and a huge big list of uh, things that you can choose from, uh, including courses that uh, you may find in another department that you think would satisfy the um, requirements or, or the, it, 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 can set, it can serve as an elective uh, that you can just get approval for. Um, and so the students can submit petitions as well to have courses that even are not on the list um, count.
Um, somebody is asking about uh, internships and uh, are there certain companies that students mostly intern at uh, coming from a BME background? So uh, maybe some of the students could and alumni could answer that question about internships and companies. Well, I, I can point out that um, Cornell Engineering in general has a career fair um, where students are given the opportunity to learn about different companies or, um, you know, submit their resumes for internships and full time positions. Uh, so that's actually how I got my first internship at Merck, um, which led to a full time position. Um, and it was a great opportunity to even go there freshman year and learn about what's even in the industry and look at different companies. So I found that to be really helpful and valuable. I'd also be happy to chime in on that because I definitely the the career fairs were definitely a great resource. I I, um, I enjoyed them as well as somebody who is kind of looking to work at a smaller startup company. Um, I would say that for people who are interested in that or want to learn more about it, um, those usually don't um, show up at a career fair, but a lot of what the, is kind of talked about as we get to the experiential learning stuff in this program, when you're talking to professors and what people will, will suggest is starting this like networking journey that really becomes a big deal as you become a, a professional if you're looking on that industry end. So what, what how that worked for me was going on using the LinkedIn platform and reaching out to different people who are in industry, you know, growing a small network with um, like the professors and my peers. And I ended up working at, you know, a, a really small startup company out in the Boston area, which is where I'm hoping to, not that specific company, but in the area where I'm hoping to work now that was doing some instrumentation work. And it was a really cool opportunity. It's one of those that um, I think you do have to put, have a lot of like personal effort to go into there, but it's definitely an option. Um, and I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of faculty um, who have some experience in there. They may have some connections that are worth talking to, to see if that's something you're interested in. Yeah, I can just add on to that. Um... Another way, because I also, uh, in my first internship at a synthetic biology company, was also looking for something small scale. Uh, some states and some regions also have like life sciences centers that will fund uh, internship experiences. So again, uh, looking locally is one great way for if you're looking for something more small scale. But again, like Parker and Shweta mentioned, if you're looking for more big companies, then definitely networking via the career fair is recommended. But just explore a lot of different options. Yeah, it's kind of add on to that as well. Um, in addition to career fair, there's also many societies on campus such as BMES, uh, which is the Biomedical Engineering Society, as well as SWE, so Society for Women Engineers, who invite guest speakers from different types of companies. So recently, um, there was a guest speaker from Generon. Um, they're taking a field trip to Boeing sometime soon. So all of these experiences kind of introduce, I guess, people who are part of these organizations to professionals outside of Cornell. And then that kind of goes to what Parker was saying about creating those networks. And I guess that's how we kind of start making those as well. And then maybe I'll just share uh, screen quickly again. Um, so here are some companies where our graduates have gone to. And so these might also be good options for, uh, you know, checking for internship positions too. Um, and then we also have a, an advisory board um, uh, who consist of uh, professionals from industry and as well as academia. And so, you know, we're, I think most of the advisory board members uh, would also be happy to, to get involved with um, opportunities for, for our students. Yeah. Alexandra, there was a question about uh, students who have yet to graduate, what do you hope to do with your degree? Raj already typed in his answer. Do you want to give us your thoughts on what your hopes are? Yeah, um, so I'm going to be graduating from my undergrad in May, and then I'm going to be graduating with my master's this December. Afterwards, I hope to go into industry, potentially at some sort of innovation and technical center. So this summer, thanks to my connections that I got here from Cornell, I'm going to be working for NYU Langone for the hospital for the Technical and Innovation Center. And a lot of that is doing like 
innovation and product design, something that I kind of grew to love through the project teams here. So if I could potentially do that right after my graduation, that would also be something I look forward to. There's a specific question here about um, uh, vaccine or medication development. So this person is very interested in vaccine and medication development. Do you think um, BME instead of cellular and molecular biology would be the correct major for that path? Um, I'd love to to kind of start digging into that and then have other people weigh in because I think there's a question after. It's kind of a broad thing that is important for choosing uh, the BME path and whether it works for you. So as somebody who, um, when I got to Cornell, I didn't know about the BME major right until I got here. And I really fell in love with it right as I saw it because it was this eureka moment for me of, oh, I want to do, I don't have like a very particular interest, but I know that I want to like help people. And I wanted to do engineering to do that. Um, but through my peers, I know lots of people who really weren't sure, you know, with BME as uh, Dr. Adi said, um, we're really, or I think it was uh, Professor Vandermulen also, the, you're kind of at a crossroads. We're looking at a, um, distributions across all of Cornell engineering in terms of the technical work that we do, but our focus is on the health portion. So I would say that um, there's not, I maybe not be, would not be the best person to answer this particular question of should you go to BME or not, but I will say that that first um, year, if you were to go into Cornell engineering, you're not technically affiliated with BME yet, and you just have time to really figure out for yourself if that's the right path for you. So using that time to look into um, look into the cellular and molecular biology program and arts and sciences, or maybe the chemical engineering, I know it also has biomolecular. Um, you have a lot of freedom to look around and see what's around you. And I do think that there are people who go into vaccines and medication within BME and they're very successful, but if maybe there are some people who they really don't want to learn anything about electronics or instrumentation. They, they never want to do it. And I think it's really good to give it a try. I love doing that, even if it's not what I'm going to go into. But just know that there's a lot around you that you have access to. So using that first year, I think, is a really important step. Yeah, I think if you're excited by uh, solving problems in, in human health, right, and uh, up the application of you know physics, computer science, mathematics, uh, and design, then biomedical engineering really is that is that sort of perfect match. Um, when it comes to going out into industry, um, biomedical engineers will really uh, will, will will have a leg up on other engineers in in the in their broader perspective, right? And how um, engineering solutions, right? You know, right from conception to uh, sort of adoption in, in a clinical setting, right? What are the challenges associated with um, all of those different uh, stages of, of, of progression, right? Of, a, of development of a product or, um, and so you get to really uh, study these engineering principles. You get to cover wide breadth. And, and sometimes the challenge is with the wide breadth, how do you also get the depth? And our answer to that is uh, are these concentrations, right? So you get to go deep in, in an area that you really uh, enjoy and you want to go deep in. Uh, but then you also have the, the, the breadth that is uh, covers the context from the conception of, of and, 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 and development of, a, of, a, of a, uh, a new solution for healthcare to its clinical adoption, right? And so that's, I think, the advantage of a biomedical engineer. Yeah, there's just a couple of things I want to add to that. Uh, Parker mentioned your first year as a great uh, opportunity to explore. Uh, one of the courses you guys will take as uh, new engineering students is your, um, your I think it's ENGRI courses. Those are the courses that basically allow you to choose any specific uh, engineering discipline or maybe even outside of engineering. Like I took an entrepreneurship course just because I felt like it, but you can really just explore whatever you want. Um, the other thing I'll say is because this is a question about vaccine and medicine and because I'm a little bit biased about advocating BME, um, there's a saying when it comes to uh, like healthcare, like don't try to like choose your specialty, let your specialty find you. And I think that really goes to the heart of what BME is all about in that like, I know many students who both came into and went out of BME who, even if they didn't ultimately choose BME, like 
found out that they were interested in something that they never would have imagined, right? And so BME, I think, gives you a unique opportunity as compared with uh, the biological major in CALS, et cetera, to really look at so many different quantitative and you know, engineering and multi-skill aspects that you won't get in any other any other discipline. And so from the point of view of finding what it is you're interested in, because I feel like that's what this question is really about, personally, there is no major better than BME. And this is somebody who, by the way, for me personally, like probably for the first year and a half after I entered Cornell, I was questioning, am I in the right place in terms of uh, the BME major, right? I contemplated switching to chemi, right? Uh, at times, even like applied in engineering physics, because I have a lot of interests, but I would say that at the end of the day, I keep coming back to BME because it allows me to do the perfect mixture of whatever it is I want. It sounds a little bit like a pitch, but reflecting back on it, absolutely, this is the truth. I think it's okay to pitch BME in this forum. <laughs> um, we do have a couple more questions. I don't know if people can stay another few minutes or if um, I did put in the Q&A that if you have additional questions or your questions have not been answered, that you can um, email me and I will get the answer to your questions. Um, could I quickly have your um, email address, oh. Sharon? Yeah, Does everyone I, have your email? Yeah, okay, good. Yes, yeah. I put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say I don't I the other people in the panel can chime in if they're interested in, but if you have specific questions for me or um or anyone, like I'd be more than happy to answer those by proxy. So um Sharon, if any come in and they're asking for me specifically, I, I'd love to also available to to talk to anybody about that. Yeah, Sharon is our central point here, as as you can see. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for uh, for attending, and um, thank you to our panelists, our our staff, and our alumni, and our faculty, and our students. I appreciate everybody being here, um, and uh, we hope that you consider uh, a BME path in, in your in your path to Cornell. Yeah, and there'll be plenty of opportunities for further exploration. Um, in your first semester here, you'll be encouraged to explore multiple uh, majors. And uh, at that time, we'll be, we'll be ready to um, provide any additional information and answer questions as well. Yeah. Oh, and I should also mention that we will get the, a recording of this webinar on our um, website. Um, I think I put it in the, the Q&A. We have a recording from 2021, but we'll we'll post this one um, soon. Thank you, everyone. Really exciting, and we hope to see you in the in the in the fall. Thank you. Thank you.